When we last met for Sunday school, we went over the doctrine of justification. And so it follows today that we'll go over the doctrine of adoption. Um, but we had some great questions, great interaction uh, during our last Sunday school that we didn't have enough time to really round out our study on justification. So just some closing thoughts, closing thoughts on justification, and then we'll move on to adoption. Um, for today's Sunday school, either fold your page or keep your finger on Romans 8 verses 15 through 17. If you have a bookmark, a ribbon, use that. But we will be referencing those verses quite a bit today. So go ahead and turn there. Uh, and some closing thoughts on justification. So we had some really good questions toward the end of the last lesson. And so I, I want to kind of summarize those questions and uh, our response to those questions as succinctly as possible. So any person, you know, by God's grace and through his power can be saved with a very simple gospel presentation. Uh, I'm, sure I'm sure many of you guys have shared the gospel before. Oftentimes, we can share the gospel in two to three, maybe five minutes. The gospel is a very simple message, right? We start off by saying, you are born in sin. You're a sinner now, and you have offended a holy and just God. And because God is just, he must punish sin. And if you don't repent, when you die, eternal torment awaits you. But God has provided the way of salvation we must confess our sins, seek his forgiveness, and trust his son, Jesus Christ, alone for our salvation. Our own good works cannot save us. Jesus died on the cross, taking up on himself the punishment of sin that we deserved. And we usually end by saying, repent, turn away from your sins, and trust in Jesus for salvation. That took me all of 60 to 90 seconds to share the gospel. Yes, brother. And the resurrection. Amen. The resurrection is important. It's funny because um, if you guys uh, have ever received one of Chris Bess's uh, tracks, it has the gospel very succinctly on the back. So um, that's my little plug, brother. You may have more requests coming your way. So in those two minutes, we didn't have the time to exposit the doctrine of justification like we did two weeks ago, right? That took us 45 minutes and still... We didn't cover everything exhaustively. But still, in those two minutes, we admonish that person, repent of your sins and trust in Jesus alone. And God can use that gospel presentation as short and succinct as it is to save anyone. Someone can believe the gospel, be saved, and sadly, sadly, be discipled under faulty doctrine or join a bad church. I think many with no Christian upbringing or with little discernment go down this path. But we are confident that a true believer would receive correction, would be open to correction, would be open to having their theology corrected, even if that takes time. So to be clear on the doctrine of justification, we know this, but salvation is by grace alone alone through faith alone, in Christ alone. And our good works do not contribute to our salvation, nor do they keep us saved, as some modern Pauline interpretations might say. But obviously it would be hard to exposit what all of that means while also being brief, which is why it's so important that new believers especially join a solid church where doctrine is fleshed out. A gospel presentation that doesn't mention the work or person of Christ or a gospel presentation that says you contribute to your own salvation by your own good works is no gospel presentation at all. That is not the gospel. And, you know, we have obviously uh, Armenian brothers on the other side of the aisle um, whom we love but disagree with, and they would also agree with many of our gospel presentations. Functionally, they do view faith as a quote-unquote work, which is why they're okay with saying phrases like choose God and so on and so forth, but they do acknowledge that 
we are not saved by our works, so we have to be fair in assessing them also. So just some points of clarification. Um, you know, I, I know we had some questions there toward the end of our last Sunday school, and I hope that helps. I hope that's clear. If, uh, if there are any more questions, please um, let's talk after Sunday school. Uh, we had some great dialogue last time, and it's always an encouragement for all teachers, right, when folks come up and ask questions and engage during the lesson. So um, now on to adoption. Adoption. And Lord willing, we can cover all of our material today. Um, we have Romans 8 open, hopefully, uh, each and every one of us in our Bibles. So these two doctrines, justification and adoption, they are different, but they are also inseparable. Adoption into God's family is a direct result of and can only be achieved if you have first been justified. That's a necessary component. It brings us great comfort to know that in Christ, not only has God forgiven us of our sins, and not only have we been spared God's wrath, but in Christ we are also reconciled to God and brought into God's family. For us as humans, people, we may forgive someone, right? But how often do we also invite that person to become our closest and best friend? That's rare. But in God, when we are saved, though we have greatly offended him, he doesn't spare his love. He doesn't shun us. He embraces us as any loving father would his children. That's amazing. It is amazing. That's my son, by the way. Yeah, for those who are visiting. But let us also be clear that adoption is a privilege given only to those who are in Christ. That is, those who have repented, those who have sought forgiveness, and have been justified the way that we discussed a few weeks ago. Modern theologians, they conflate the creational fatherhood of God to also include the redemptive fatherhood of God. Now, we would all agree that creatively and providentially, God does sustain all of humankind. We read this in Acts 17, verses 25 and following, James 1, 17 and 18. God sustains all of humanity and blesses us with his common grace. But redemptively speaking, salvifically speaking, he is father to only those who have been born again. Scripture calls those who have not been born from above sons of disobedience and children of wrath. We were obviously once in that position, but by God's grace, we are now considered children of God. And there's a quote by John Murray in his book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied, that I think captures this very well. He says, to substitute the message of God's universal fatherhood for that which is constituted by redemption and adoption is to annul the gospel, to make it null and void. It means the degradation of this highest and richest of relationships to the level of that relationship which all men sustain to God by creation. Those who conflate God's creational fatherhood with his redemptive fatherhood open the door to universalism, which, like Murray says, invalidates the gospel message. And so we reject that notion, and we invite those who do not know God as redemptive father to turn to Christ so that they would be brought near to God. So that's our introduction and now, if you're taking notes, these are the three headings that we'll look at today. So when we study justification, we use the Westminster Shorter Catechism definition as our guide. Today, we have these three points right here. We'll look first at the nature of adoption in that it's forensic, much like justification. We'll look at the blessings of adoption, two specifically, intimacy and inheritance. And lastly, we'll look at the result of adoption, that being sanctification. All right, so this is a bit of review, but also it's a lily pad into our first point. What does the word forensic mean? 
That's the first question. And why do we say that justification is forensic? I don't see Brother David here, so somebody's got to speak up. What does forensic mean? Yes, brother. It has legal ramifications. That's right. Right. Forensic means, uh, means legal, right? It pertains to legal matters. And we use the example of forensic science, for example, right? That is the study or the gathering of evidence for uh, legal courtrooms, legal settings. And so applied to justification, forensic means pertaining to legal matters, legal ramifications. So why do we say that justification is forensic or legal? That's right. We've broken God's law. We've broken God's law. I saw Sister Rebecca's hand go up too. Yeah, so God's judge. If we judge, then we are declared righteous before God. That's right. So we've broken God's law, and we are guilty under our own failure to fulfill his law. And so in order to be declared righteous, like our sister said, the righteousness of Christ who is perfectly righteous, he is the only one who is perfectly righteous, needs to be imputed or credited to our account. That's the only way that we can be declared just. That's right. And this is all legal language. God is the judge of all the earth, and he judges righteously. So then, applying it now to adoption, it is also a forensic matter. We said that when we are justified, there is a change in our legal status. We go from being condemned and guilty under our failure to keep God's law to then being justified and considered righteous, like our sister said, based on the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. Our legal change before God translates into a relational change with God also. Those of us who were once separate from Christ, as Ephesians said, having no hope and without God in the world, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We have entered into a different relationship with God on the basis of our new legal status, on the basis of being justified. John 1.12, for example, this is interesting, includes legal overtones, legal language, speaking of adoption. It says, but as many received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. The Greek expression there for gave the right can also mean or can also be translated to give legal right. And I mentioned that we would be in Romans 8 quite a bit today. We can read those verses now. Romans 8 verses 15 through 17 these are the verses that most often come to mind when speaking of adoption. I'll read it for us. It says, Romans 8, 15, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. And interestingly, the Greek word there for adoption, found in verse 15. In verse 15, we see the word adoption, having received a spirit of adoption, was also used in contemporary classical Greek literature to denote the objective placing in the status of a child. Paul's readers understood the legal nature behind his use of this word, adoption. And notice the definition includes the word objective. There was a surety, a certainty, a legality behind the changes in status. And so the same applies to us. Our adoption is objective. It is sure and it is secure in Christ. Later on in Romans 8.30, we read, and these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. So if you have been justified, you have been adopted. And you will be glorified.
glorified. These are the promises of God for his children. Your salvation and your status as a child of God will not change because God, our Father, sustains them. And he's promised this to us. But there's, there's more happening in Romans 8, 15, and 16. I'll read those verses again. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Commenting on verse 16, Sinclair Ferguson says the following. This is really interesting. Doubtless, in the background here is the Old Testament principle that in a court of law, any evidence needs to be established by two witnesses. Ferguson refers to passages in Deuteronomy and other portions of the Old Testament, which call for two or more witnesses in legal matters. So in writing his letter to the Romans, Paul draws from that Old Testament background, from that Old Testament law and procedure to show us the forensic and legal nature of adoption. Now, I tried to condense this quote and paraphrase it as best as possible. But this is, this is John Owen, so you can't paraphrase John Owen. Uh, you just have to take it at face value and enjoy it. So it's a lengthy quote. Can you guys even see that? I hope you can. I try to make it as big as possible. But we'll read this together because it really ministered to me, and I think you all will enjoy it just the same. So this is his commentary on Romans 8, 15, 16, and 17. And he's speaking here of that courtroom setting in these verses. So we'll begin. It says, the spirit comes and bears witness in this case. An allusion it is to judicial proceedings in point of titles and evidences. The judge being set, the person concerned, lays his claim, produceth his evidences and pleads them. His adversaries endeavoring all that in them lies to invalidate them and disannul his plea, and to cast him in his claim. In the midst of the trial, a person of known and approved integrity comes into the court and gives testimony fully and directly on behalf of the claimer, which stops the mouths of all his adversaries and fills the man that pleaded with joy and satisfaction. So is it in this case, the soul by the power of its own conscience is brought before the law of God. There a man puts his plea that he is a child of God, that he belongs to God's family and for this and produceth all his evidences, everything whereby faith gives him an interest in God. Satan, in the meantime, opposite with all his might, sin and law assist him. Many flaws are found in his evidences. The truth of them all is questioned. And the soul hangs in suspense as to this issue. This is so good. In the midst of the plea and contest, the comforter comes, the spirit comes. And by a word of promise or otherwise, overpowers the heart with a comfortable persuasion and bears down all objections that his plea is good and that he is a child of God. Those scripture tells us that objectively we have been confirmed as children of God, our minds and hearts, they often doubt our inclusion into God's family. And that's a war that's happening. We war with the flesh and we war with Satan, our adversary, as we remind ourselves constantly, yes, I believe in Christ's word. Yes, I believe the gospel. But in our weakness, that cloud of doubt often looms over us. It feels like it stays, like it follows us. But it's in that weakness that the spirit who cannot lie comes alongside us as a witness to confirm that, yes, you, me, we are legally Children of God. And that's a great, great and amazing ministry of the Spirit. To have the Spirit as a witness on our behalf. Confirming, validating that we are children of God. And that our status does not change. 
And it's through this Spirit's witness, it's through our adoption that we have this newfound intimacy with our Heavenly Father. So we'll look at that point next under the blessings of adoption. I'll pause there, though, before I get started on the next point. Any questions or comments on the nature of adoption? All right, brother, this, this brother first, Christian, and then... <laughs> That's a good question, and I think I think my last point may answer that. Um, if it doesn't, tell me, okay? Stop me in my tracks. Um, but I will say there's a there's a, a kind of a, a twofold um, tension going on there, right? That the Spirit does bear witness, but as sons and daughters of God, we are also called to produce fruit, right? And so can the Spirit bear witness to someone who's not producing the fruit of the Spirit? So um, more on that later, um, but that's an appetizer. Um, Brother Chris. What would be your thoughts on someone saying, if they thought they were an ethnic Jew or they were born into a Jewish community, and they would say, I don't need to be adopted, I've always belonged to God. Hmm. So how would adoption work in the case of a Jew? Would, would it be, or would you agree that Paul himself was adopted? Yeah, I would, right? It's a spiritual family, right? Um, it's not an ethnic, uh, nor is it a geographical family. It's a spiritual family, and there's a lot to that. Um, there's a lot to that, but that that's what my answer would be right you still have to be born again you are not a son of god you're not a daughter of god unless you have been born from above um and and unless you unless you've been born right you are still considered a a child of wrath and a son of disobedience and it's interesting to see uh you know the different references that are used for children of god we'll look at that later but we're called children of the light sons of the day right and all of those qualifiers all of those adjectives are descriptive of only those who have been born again. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, Brother Ryan. I think to do that um, in support of what you're saying and what Chris is saying, perhaps just appealing through John 3, yeah. 1 through 17 or so. That's right. Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus. I believe he's quoting Ezekiel there, referring back. He's also quoting Numbers. Um, and so it, that might be a moment in which you can Testament sacrifices, the types and shadows pointing to the ultimate sacrifice in kind of supplementing that. That's right. Yeah, and I like this language, right? Being born, being a child, all of that language is interconnected. And so you can use all of these verses in support of your defense. That's right. John 3, that's a good point, brother. And Pastor Landon? That's right. That's right. Amen. Amen. All right. Moving on now to the blessing of intimacy with the Father. In Romans 8.15, I told you guys to keep a bookmark there, and I didn't. Romans 8.15, it says that we have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, now Romans 8, 15, Galatians 4, 6, these are parallel passages, but there is one more place where this phrase, Abba, Father, is found. Maybe you didn't need that hint, but I gave you guys one anyway. It's in the Gospels. Where is that phrase found, Abba, Father? Don't pull up your phones. Don't Google it. Yeah, yeah, um... That's right. So I'll, uh, I'll flip through there. 
if somebody can, can guess the uh, guess or, or knows the exact portion of Scripture, I have it here in front of me. That's right. Jesus in Gethsemane, Mark 14, 36. That still counts, brother. Mark 14, 36. This is Jesus speaking. It says, And he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Anticipating his most agonizing moment, Jesus, the Son of God, cries out to his Father. Jesus approaches God the Father with boldness, knowing that he has his Father's ear. They live in perfect, uninterrupted communion. Now Paul picks up on this phrase, Abba Father, and uses it to describe our own cry. What a, what a privilege, how great it is to know that we can approach God, our Father, with the same language that Jesus himself used. And of course, it's only by Jesus' work, ultimately, that we have such a privilege and let's continue dissecting Romans 8.15. Romans 8.15. The Greek word there that we see for cry out, it's the word krazo. Krazo, which normally indicates a loud or needy cry. And the same verb is used elsewhere in the Gospels of the blind beggar crying out for help. So Paul seems to indicate that while that term, Abba Father, is one of endearment and love, the plea itself described here is one of intense need. Sinclair Ferguson makes the following comparison. It is the cry of a child who has stumbled, tripped, and fallen, and is crying out for his or her father to come help. Now, you don't have to have children to know what that sounds like. All right, many of us, all of us have seen children fall, they hurt themselves, and the moment they get back up, who do they call for? Mama or Papa, immediately. It's instinctual. And there's a lesson there. We ought to be the same way. When we stumble into sin, when we fall into temptation, or walk through valleys of doubt and despair, we should also instinctively, immediately cry out to our Heavenly Father for help. It's in our times of need that our Heavenly Father ministers to us and reminds us that we are still His. One commentator made a very interesting comparison to show just how backwards we often think, right? If we were to find out that a father withheld love from his children, or worse, just ignored them, disowned them for failing at a task, we would say, shame on that father. We would be so upset if a, if a father abandoned his children because they failed at a certain task. Yet functionally, we sometimes think that way of our Heavenly Father. We fail, we enter into seasons of sin, and we think there's no way God can forgive me. There's no way God can restore me. There's no way God loves me. But God does love his children. And he does forgive us. Remember the words of Scripture, 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, obviously, we fathers here, we strive our best to be good fathers to our children, but still we are imperfect. We fail. But there is one perfect father, one perfect father who loves us who embraces us, who forgives us, who cleanses us, who ministers to us. That's our Heavenly Father with whom we have been restored. Now, I mentioned earlier that Abba Father, that phrase is a term of endearment. This isn't to say that we belittle God when we come to him in prayer. But on the contrary, this presents us with the condescension, the great condescension of God. And his unmatched glory and love in that though we are totally unclean, 
He has made a way through his son, Jesus Christ, by which we can approach that divine presence of God and draw near with confidence, as Hebrews says. We draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Because God so graciously gives us his ear in prayer, we come to him with love, with humility, with adoration, worship, and thanksgiving. We are given full right. Think about that. Full right and access to bring our petitions before God, though this privilege we certainly don't deserve. And obviously we have many privileges as adopted sons and daughters of God, including our heavenly inheritance. We'll look at that next with the time that we have left. In Romans 8, 17, we read of an, of an inheritance. It says, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Isn't this amazing that eternal life is ours? Everlasting communion with God is ours. Glorification is promised to us. It is ours. Philippians 1.6 tells us the following, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Those whom God has predestined as sons and daughters will be preserved until the very end. They will be resurrected and brought into eternal glory. We read Romans 8.28-30 earlier, but let's read it again. It says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. That's the inheritance that's promised to us. Now, Abraham was also promised an inheritance, which, according to the book of Hebrews, finds its fulfillment in heaven. This is Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 10. It's up on the screen. And the same inheritance that's promised to Abraham is our inheritance. We are promised citizenship in that kingdom of God, in the city of God, in the holy Zion. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. That's amazing. Now... There are many other places in which uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, speaks about inheriting or inheritance throughout Scripture. Can anybody name maybe one or two verses where Paul speaks about an inheritance? Ephesians 1. Yep, Ephesians 1. That's one that I have down here. Ephesians 1. Uh, there, are, there are many, right? There are many places where he speaks of an inheritance. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and fifteen fifty. Here he specifies those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. In Titus 3, 7, he refers to our inheritance specifically as eternal life. And as Pastor mentioned in Ephesians 1, we see tons of inheritance language and we're promised that everlasting union and communion with Christ. Now, okay, I have to be mindful of our time, but we're doing well. In brief words, as succinctly as you can, can somebody define the already not yet principle? I was just telling brother that when I first got to Heritage Grace and I heard that phrase, it went right over my head. I had no idea what we were talking about. But now you see it everywhere, right? Um, what is that already not yet principle? Brother Ryan? That's right. 
That's a, that's a great example, and that's a great definition of that already not, already not yet principle. Yes, brother? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Both of those definitions, very helpful. Um, here's what I wrote. We actively take part in the kingdom of God now, in part, but the kingdom and its blessings will not reach its full expression until the consummation, the end. That's the already not yet principle. And there are several verses, several portions of scripture that we can direct you to, to show you that principle is active. So we are confident now that we are citizens of God's kingdom, though we still await the full expression of his kingdom. So because we have not yet been glorified, being on this side of glory, we will still suffer. That's spoken of in this verse on inheritance, Romans 8, 17. We will still suffer. It says it in verses 17 and 18. The latter half of verse 17 says, If indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Suffering, even in the forms of persecution, is promised to the Christian. Jesus reminds us in John 15, 20, remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. But we trust that every trial we face is for our good. It says that just a few verses down in verse 28. And that's often hard to see from our own vantage point, but God's will is perfect. And nothing happens, nothing happens unless he has ordained it. So if we trust that his will is perfect, if we believe that he is sovereign, then we can rest knowing whatever we face Suffering, persecution, trials, troubles is for our good and God's glory. We find great comfort, great solace in the words of Revelation 21.4, which say, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. For the unbeliever, this world is as good as it gets. They go from bad to worse. This is as good as it gets. For the son and daughter of God, this world is as bad as it gets. We look to the new creation, to the new world, to the new heavens, the age to come, where every pain will be relieved. Every teardrop that's gone down our cheeks, down our face, will be wiped away. All thanks to our heavenly Father, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But in this last minute, I want to remind us that while we're in this age, we still have work to do. So we move on to our last point, the result of adoption, that being sanctification. And this hopefully answers your question, brother. We spoke at length earlier about the Spirit's witness in our status as children of God. That was Romans 8, 15 through 17. The Spirit's witness, his ministry to us, but let's remind ourselves of the context also of these verses. Right before these verses on adoption, we have verses 12 through 14. If you're still there, you can read along with me. I have it up on the screen also. It says, So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So Paul is speaking to those of those who mortify the flesh and walk by the Spirit. As I mentioned earlier, the Spirit cannot be a witness to someone who doesn't show themselves to be of the Spirit. The Spirit would be made a liar if he were to be a witness to that person. We cannot call ourselves sons and daughters of God if we have no desire to reflect and embody our new family's characteristics. It would be totally ironic. It wouldn't make any sense 
For us to call ourselves sons and daughters of God if we have no regard for God's holiness. It wouldn't make sense at all. The ministry of the Spirit as witness is for those who seek to demonstrate the Spirit's fruit. Galatians 5.22, it gives us this fruit of the Spirit. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It was really hard not to sing that because my, my son plays a song with the fruit of the Spirit. And so I have to train myself not to sing it in that way. But that's Galatians 5.22. These are the characteristics, the attributes, the fruit of a child of God. Elsewhere, we are called to live as blameless children of God in the midst of a perverse generation. Philippians 2.15. We are called to walk as children of light. Ephesians 5.8. And sons of day. 1 Thessalonians 5.5. 5. So sanctification, that is the demonstration that we have been justified, that we have been adopted into this new family. And I think that our next Sunday school is on justification. So this is a good segue into that. Um, we are about two minutes over time. Uh, so if you have any questions, please uh, you know, come see me after Sunday school. But we have about uh, 10 to 12 minutes of break, and then we will resume our service here in a bit. God bless you guys. Thank you.